On today's episode of Mr. Grizzled, uh, can you run a Ryzen CPU on a potato? Y yes. Yes, it's fine. I always sort of chuckle. I mean, everybody gets all bent out of shape about VRM and power delivery on one of the most energy efficient CPUs that has been released in the last 10 years for desktop CPU usage. This is the ASUS Prime B550MA. This is one of the least expensive B550 motherboards that you can possibly get. I did not mean it in a pejorative way when I said run a Ryzen CPU on a potato. Sometimes you don't need the gamer bling. You don't need a lot of really insane stuff. Will this CPU, this, this motherboard run a 16 core CPU? Yes, it absolutely will. It's relatively anemic six plus two VRM. We'll take a look at that. We'll do some testing. I'm even gonna get out the thermal camera. But first, let's unbox. So first thing, the Wi-Fi antenna. Good job, Asus. Look, this is the kind of Wi-Fi antenna you should look for for your Wi-Fi solution, which by the way, is an Intel AX200. I'm probably gonna mention that about five times because it comes up in different ways. This is a movable antenna. It's not just a little stick that's at the back of your motherboard. I mean, your computer case is mostly metal and radio waves have a hard time traveling through grounded metal. That's problematic a lot of the time, pretty much all the time. And this lets you move the antenna somewhere that you can receive it. A lot of the time on inexpensive motherboards, I just see those cheap little rubber duck antennas. No, this is what you need. And this is one of the least expensive boards that Asus has for AM4 for people that are gonna be DIYing their system. And it comes with a proper antenna. Good job, Asus. All right, also in the box, two SATA cables, your motherboard manual, and installation CD, and an M.2 screw, and your IO shield, because it doesn't have a built-in IO shield. Okay, first up, let's take a look at the board layout and the PCIe layout. Board layout, it's pretty standard. It's a micro ATX motherboard. We have four SATA connections at the bottom edge of the motherboard. There's no right angle connection or anything like that here. If you use a big honkin' like triple slot GPU, you might have some issues with the cabling, but Probably not, it's, it looks like it'll clear it, but uh, at least with the GPUs that I have that are two and a half slot, it wasn't a problem. But maybe if you're gonna try to run like the, the giant EVGA 2080 Ti FTW, I mean just, and SATA, I don't, it seems like that one, that one might be problematic a little bit. I mean, I was able to wedge it in there, but it's probably fine. You've also got a 30 pin USB 3.0 header, two USB 2 headers, so you get four total USB 2 ports and two USB 3.0 ports. And then you've also got front panel audio. There's two four pin fan headers right at the top edge of the motherboard. So if you're gonna run a push pull tower, you totally can. Although if you're buying this motherboard, just, just go with the inbox cooler, it's fine. There's also one four pin fan header near the rear of the motherboard, which would be great for a, a rear case exhaust. There's a, a final four pin fan header at the bottom edge of the motherboard. We do have LED headers. You know, if you're gonna bling this out and do the gamer thing, you can run digital and 50-50 headers off of this motherboard. You got two 50-50 headers and one digital header. So pretty good mix if you are gonna do the RGB thing. There's also RGB underneath the uh, the PCB separation for the sound card. So you get a little bit of backlit illumination on the RGB side of things. Now in terms of other connectors on this motherboard, not much. PCIe layout and M.2. So there's two M.2 slots. The bottom M.2 slot is through the chipset. It's a PCI Express 3.0 by four interface to the chipset and then the chipset goes to the CPU. The top M.2 is a PCI Express 4.0 directly into the CPU. Our single X16 slot is electrical X16 wired directly into the CPU, also PCI Express 4.0. This is the big differentiator with B550. If you get a B450 motherboard, yeah, I know some of the B450 motherboards are super tempting and really inexpensive, but they're not PCI Express 4.0. Not even like on the best of days are they PCI Express 4.0. I know, I know if you Google it, there's some early reports of people getting PCI Express 4.0 working on B450. Uh, trust me, mostly that was not stable. Those motherboards were not designed for PCI Express 4.0 and it is very hard to get a qualified, certified good PCI Express 4.0 signal that will remain good and stable throughout the lifetime of the system. You know, you just, you don't want weird crashing and just weird terribleness with your system. So I, I get why AMD was like, no, let's just not even try PCI Express 4.0 on B450. Not a good idea. I mean, it might've worked for some people, but most people, not so much. Then we've got two physical by one slots that are also wired directly into the B550 chipset. You may be wondering, it's like, 
what's the big deal with X570 versus B550? X570 is a nice chipset. It's PCI Express 4.0 itself, and it also offers downstream PCI Express 4.0 connectivity. As a result, it does require a cooling fan. That was one of the biggest complaints with X570 motherboards. Almost all of them needed a chipset cooling fan. Well, with B550, you don't need a chipset cooling fan because it's not PCI Express 4.0. It's not pushing those big, big data numbers, so the silicon is not going to get hot. A passive heatsink, like the smallest B550 heatsink that I've seen on any motherboard, is fine. It's completely okay. So, yeah. I don't know. People, people are weird. Now, I mentioned the relatively anemic VRM. Yeah, we do have a, a heatsink on the back set here. This is for the CPU phases, but we also have no heatsink at all for some of the VRM circuitry at the top edge of the motherboard for the, the plus two side of the six plus two configuration. So I don't normally haul out the FLIR, but which is an infrared you know thermal camera, but it's interesting. Remember how I said the, the VRM at the top edge of the motherboard doesn't have any heat sink? Well, look at that. Half of it doesn't even get warm. This is with the Prime 95 test, but the hottest part of the VRM gets up to about 60 degrees C, like 58 degrees C, something like that. And that's the part that doesn't have a VRM. So the one grouping does get hot, but the other one doesn't, which suggests that the one that doesn't is probably the system on chip, even though I'm running the Prime 95 torture test. But the other VRM doesn't get as hot as the rest of the VRM that is actually under the heatsink, but it still gets pretty toasty. The rest of the VRMs are at about 50, 52 degrees C. So that little tiny block of aluminum, that's good for about 10 degrees C. Still, this should show you that even with a 12 core CPU, even Prime 95, even with PBO, 60 degrees C for an unheatsinked VRM, it's not terrible. As long as this thing has reasonable airflow, it doesn't have to be a jet engine, it doesn't have to be a turbine, this will run a 3900X, no problem, no instability issues, no crashing issues, no throttling issues. These performance numbers of our 3900X are within 1% of our 3900X on other systems. This is also a newer 3900X, so this CPU is using upwards of 163 watts through this AM4 CPU, and this VRM solution didn't really have any trouble delivering a stable experience with that. Now you might be wondering, okay, what about the XT processors? You can overclock those a little bit more. Yeah, I would not recommend this motherboard for overclocking. I mean, you got me there. It's not terrible, but you could definitely get a better experience just spending a few bucks more. If you look at the B550M Plus even, what do you get for Plus? Well, you get a better sound card. It's better than the Realtek ALC 887 that's on this. You get an ALC 1200, which is, it's a, it's a pretty reasonable step up. You also get a 2.5 gig LAN. I don't think that anybody's really going to use a 2.5 gig LAN on this kind of a motherboard because if you can find a two and a half gig ethernet switch, they're kind of expensive for what they are. So, you know, cost conscious people, I don't think are super worried about two and a half gig LAN. I think they would get more use out of dual one gig LAN, for example, than, uh, uh, than a two and a half gig LAN, but that's neither here nor there. Let's take a look at the rear IO. At the rear I.O., we've got a combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port, two USB 3.0, 3.1 Gen 1 ports. Those are 5 gigabit. Let's just call it 5 10 gigabit. Two USB 5 gigabit ports. We also got two USB 10 gigabit ports. Our antenna connections for our Intel Wi-Fi 6, the AX200 that I was mentioning before. We've got our Realtek 1 gig wired NIC interface. VGA. VGA. Yeah, well, tells you the segment this motherboard's aimed at. VGA, DVI, and HDMI. That's for coming fourth generation APUs. They're, they're kind of out already for OEMs. OEMs are already building systems around these kinds of APUs. So you might actually see system integrators using this motherboard with, you know, Ryzen plus Vega in the 4000 series, like the eight core plus a Vega APU. This motherboard wouldn't be a bad choice for that. A little nice little uh, Ryzen workstation with built-in video that you don't even have to worry about the, the PCIe slot. Could be a thing. And then our Realtek audio solution. Now that 887 is technically a 7.1 audio solution, but we've only got 7.1 worth of output here. So you can have 7.1 audio and no inputs or, you know, 5.1 and one input or 2.1 and two and in, two inputs, line and microphone. And the audio connection stuff is on a separate part of the PCB. So it does help with signal to noise ratio, but it's the SNR is not anywhere near as good as some of the higher end boards that you get. It's passable, it's reasonable, you can game on it, it's it's fine. A USB DAC would go a long way, even a $20 USB DAC would go a long way toward improving your sound situation, but honestly, it's fine. In terms of Linux support, well, if you wanna turn this into a Linux workstation, everything on the board is pretty well supported. Uh, even the 
uh, temperature reporting chipset. I was able to hack on the module a little bit and get it to work fine in Ubuntu 20.04 using the latest mainline kernel from kernel.org. So I expect that most of the anything anybody would run into is probably self-inflicted or distro related. No RGB controller support in Linux, of course, but the audio stuff works. IOMMU, everything on the chipset is in its own IOMMU group. I mean, this wouldn't have been a great choice for a VFI or motherboard anyway, because where are you gonna put the other graphics card? I mean, you can get a PCI Express by one graphics card, but but really, really? So yeah, no, just this would be great for a Linux workstation. I mean, the eight core run VMs and 128 gigs of memory support, but yeah, uh, Linux workstation fine, Linux VFIO, you're gonna need something a little bit beefier than a micro ATX motherboard anyway. <laughs> now, memory support, the 30, the era of 1900 infinity fabric, 3800 megahertz memory support is upon us. Will this motherboard do it? Well, it did it with my Trident Z CL14 memory, but the block says that it will support up to DDR4 4000. The PCB on this motherboard is very, very thin. So I'm skeptical of that claim, but I have no CPU that I can use to really test that and confirm that. I don't have memory that fast, but the DDR4 3800 was fine. I also have OLOY DDR4 3200 128 gig kit. That also worked fine on this motherboard. Overnight stability testing, no memory errors. So I feel like 3200 to 128 gig is reasonable to expect of this motherboard and 3600 to 3800 for, you know, two sticks, 32 gigs, maybe 64 gigs and two sticks. Uh, would not be unreasonable to expect on this motherboard, but uh, you know, don't go ham and try to do 4400 128 gig I just I don't think that's gonna work on on most Ryzen motherboards because the more memory that you have and the higher density it is the More difficulty you'll have achieving those higher clocks and it's a combination of motherboard and CPU So don't blame Asus for that one So all in all this is a perfectly reasonable motherboard This is exactly the kind of motherboard that I would get for someone as a gift like if I wanted someone to enjoy the incredible insanity of a Ryzen 5 3600, which is just about the deal of the century since it came out and at current pricing, because it's an amazing CPU. It comes with a cooler. This is a really great motherboard to pair with that. Assuming that you get a reasonable graphics card. Yeah, the sound card's not the highest end. Yeah, you know, problem A, B, C, X, Y, Z, but it's not bad. And I would still probably get this motherboard versus a lower end motherboard, even in the APU situation, just because I've got that capability to swap in a new CPU later or even a discrete GPU and have reasonable performance. I also like this over a B450 choice because you can use a PCI Express 4.0 GPU like a uh, Radeon 5700 or 5700 XT or 5600. Those would be good GPUs to pair with this setup. That's been a quick look at the Prime B550M-A Wi-Fi. It is, you know, you never, get what you don't pay for but you always get what you pay for so you know keep that in mind with the price point that this motherboard is at if you want something a little higher end i've got the b550 strix in the pipeline i've got the old x570 strix going head to head with the b550 strix it's sort of a sort of that same situation playing out again where it's like b550 it's like well unless you're going to run multiple gpus or three m.2s just get the b550 i'm wendell this is level one I'm signing out i'll see you later